Hello, thanks for joining us again. Wave Nunley here with Bible Unplugged and Central Faith Builders. And uh, we're going to go back into our series on the miracles of Jesus. We took a break for Yom Kippur and did a session on that that's uh, now available for you. But uh, this will be our session number two on the miracles of Jesus. And uh, we're going to do a little quick review just to get us back up to speed from what we learned on our first session of the miracles of Jesus. What we found there was that even uh, miracles that seem to be the most outside of the mainstream, the real outliers, such as miraculous travel, when you place that back into its original context, looking at all of biblical literature, as well as material outside the Bible, between the Testaments, you find that God will, from time to time, suspend the laws of nature uh, and will do a miraculous work even such as this. So we're going to pick up now uh, with a review of miracle in general. The purpose of miracle, as we find this in the Bible, is uh, actually to meet the needs of people. God is a merciful and a compassionate God, and He desires to meet His creation right where we are uh, at any point of need that we are. And so, uh, so whenever uh, God in, uh, suspends the laws of nature and does some sort of a miracle, um, one of the main purposes is to uh, meet the needs of the apex of His created order, humankind. Another purpose is to reveal His nature. And indeed, it shows God as a benevolent ruler, as a merciful God, as one who is uh, ultimately responsible for meeting uh, even our need for daily bread. A final um, uh, purpose of the uh, of miracle that we, as we find these uh, revealed in the Bible is to extend God's kingdom rule on earth. First of all, wherever God uh, invades time and space, and suspends the natural order and performs a miracle, it is demonstrating His rule over His creation. It's not the laws of physics that rule the world, but rather it is the King of the universe. It's the God of the world uh, who is in charge and is able to do as His will uh, dictates is best for His overall purposes. In addition, on this business of extending the kingdom, um, it also extends God's kingdom numerically because as we see in the miracles of Jesus or the miracles of the uh, apostles in the uh, book of Acts, we find that miracle tends to attract attention and to retain attention long enough for the good news of God's love and His ability to radically transform lives can be disseminated among the listeners and then can have its own impact. So it ultimately brings people into God's kingdom under His rule as the great King. So uh, as the big picture uh, purposes for miracles uh, comes to be established in your heart and mind, as you look at Scripture, you will be able to read these stories of the miraculous throughout the Bible in its entirety will come into sharp focus. This time we're going to be looking at Jesus' miracles of healing. And uh, we could uh, look at a number of different, and will in this series, look at a number of different um, uh, types of miraculous activity. Most obvious would be uh, Jesus' resuscitations of the dead, uh, whether that's Lazarus or Jairus' daughter or whatever. Um, we also hear about Jesus healing by the spoken word. In other words, not even having to be physically pre present or perform some act of touch, and yet the miracle takes place. Another one th that we can list as kind of in big groups of Jesus' miracles is Jesus healing by a modality, a means or, a, or an intermediary, a method, whether that's uh, Him placing spit on someone's eyes, mud on someone's eyes, uh, someone touching the hem of Jesus' garment, or like the laying on of hands. Jesus uses lots of different means and methods or modalities to perform His miraculous work. I think that this is important for us to get this overall picture because just one example, one reason uh, for the one benefit of this um, approach to looking at miracles as a big flyover before getting down into the weeds on one specific is that this demonstrates an incredible diversity of um, approach to the miraculous by Jesus. 
It lets us know, it sends us a signal that Jesus is not tied into one particular ritual or one particular uh, formula, um, a series of words or whatever, because this is not the nature of the, the miracles that Jesus performs. We see this in the Greco-Roman world all over the place. It's all about having the right ritual down pat or memorizing or purchasing the right formula from some other um, miracle worker or magis magician. But what Jesus does is he varies his approach so much that it gives us this perspective that it's not about the ritual or the formula. It's about the power and the compassion of the God behind the miracle that is what's in view in the Bible. From the Hebrew Bible all the way through to the end of the New Testament, that is the nature of God. And that seems also to be God's nature in general. We've talked in previous sessions about God being the first greenie, about God uh, being the uh, one who uh, an, an intends to break down barriers and boundaries set up by nations or by ethnic groups or by linguistic groups. Uh, so um, uh, inclusivity, is, is that's all a part of God's plan. It's we in humanity that are being late to God's uh, parties on these parts. This business of diversity, He's a God who creates an incredibly diverse order in the world. The Bible is full of all kinds of literary diversity. The body of Christ is every nation, every kindred, every tongue, and every tribe. The gifts of the Spirit are unbelievably diverse. And so this seems to be something that God does as an expression of His unbelievably diverse character and nature. So yet we are, yet again, late to one of God's parties, the party of diversity. So let's jump into the miracles of Jesus and specifically the healing ministry of Jesus. And for this, we're going to focus even more carefully on Jesus' use of the laying on of hands. In this particular picture, you see uh, Jesus placing his hand on a little child and other uh, people bringing their little children. This uh, harkens our minds back to that uh, gospel story about the people bringing his, the, their children to Jesus to uh, bless them. The gospel of Matthew reads like this, Then some children were brought to him so that he might lay his hands on them and pray. So notice the connection between the laying on of hands and prayer. Um, and the disciples rebuked them, and then Jesus turned around and rebuked His disciples for forbidding or attempting to forbid these people from bringing their children uh, to Jesus. I want you to note the, the parallels in Mark and in Luke. The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, will often read um, sort of in tandem, in parallel. And what one doesn't make totally clear, another, or maybe the others, will, will indeed make clear. So notice that it says here that they were bringing the children to Him so that He might touch them. And Luke emphasizes the same thing, that He might touch them. So one of the purposes of this matter of laying on of hands, it's not about magic. It's not about getting the ritual right, like spreading your fingers a certain distance or having both your hands or just one hand. These are not what, uh, are, what uh, are not what are in view here, but rather it is this personal contact, personal touch, of all times in human history, now we should appreciate this because we're having to six foot distance and we're having to make sure that we've got our um, protection in place and uh, we're trying to spread out and maybe meet in neutral outdoor uh, context and the like. But this is not a problem with Jesus. And uh, this is, it should be a big speed bump for us today just because of where we're living right now. And it should jump out uh, from the page at us now as much as any other time in our lives because we're not experiencing a whole lot of physical touch. But that was indeed evidently a part of the point of this business of the laying on of hands. It has to do with personal contact and identification with the other and with the other's needs and the like. A, a display of compassion and encouragement and, and concern for the one with the need. We hear in the Gospel of Mark uh, that 
He was entreated earnestly. My little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her. There's a parallel in the Gospel of Luke that reads almost exactly the same. Interestingly, this is not in the Gospel of Matthew, which focuses maybe more uh, strongly than any of the other Gospels on Jesus' healing ministry because it's a fulfillment of prophecies in the book of Isaiah. Um, He bore our sicknesses and our pains, and by His stripes we have been healed. So uh, we don't get this in Matthew, and yet we do get it in places that uh, usually emphasize other things, the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of uh, Luke. Look at this last part of the passage. Lay your hands on her so that she can get well and live. It's not just for blessing as it was with the children. This is yet for another reason. This is to bring healing into the uh, physical being of the person who is in need. We hear also in the Gospel of Mark that when he goes to Nazareth, he experiences so much pushback that it says he could do no miracle there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and he healed them. And so here again, we get the connection between the laying on of hands and the bringing of physical healing into the body of a person in need. Uh, Another passage, and this picture should remind you of that passage. There are a couple of places, actually I think three, where Jesus heals uh, people of their blindness. This passage that we're going to look at is one of those uh, three passages. In the Gospel of Mark, and this is unique to the Gospel of Mark. It's not in Matthew, and it's also not in Luke. The parallel that I have down here is in John chapter 9. It's not really the same event. Uh, This event that we're going to hear about um, in the Gospel of Mark happens at Bethsaida, which is on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. About uh, about 80 miles further north, uh, further south, is the city of Jerusalem. And John 9 happens in Jerusalem and is happening in and around the, uh, the Temple Mount. So two completely different stories in two completely different locations. But the Gospel of Mark says... Taking the blind man by the hand, notice again, physical touch, um, alignment with, connection with, concern uh, for, identifying with the, the, the problem of the person in need. He brought him out of the village, and after spitting on his eyes and laying his hands upon him, he asked him, do you see anything? And then again, we uh, skip to verse 25. And then again, he laid his hands on him the second time and upon his eyes. And he looked intently and the man was restored and began to see everything. After the second laying on of Jesus' hands, he sees everything clearly. So again, a very clear connection between the laying on of hands and the bringing about of a physical healing. We hear about this uh, from the lips of Jesus told about what he expected the early church to look like. This is in Mark chapter 16, verse 18. They will pick up serpents, and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them, and they will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Now, I know that based on the manuscript evidence, a lot of people have concluded and, uh, that uh, this uh, passage is not, was not even originally a part of the Gospel of Mark. However, I hope that what you will see as we process through our material in this study of Jesus Uh, bringing healing by the laying on of hands, that you'll see that this passage folds very neatly, very easily dovetails uh, with other emphases that uh, demonstrate the same thing. Uh, So, for example, in the book of Acts, we read about the early church, that they chose Stephen, a bunch of other guys that are going to be ordained as the first deacons, the first servants, uh, officially appointed, uh, designated servants in the early church. It says in verse 6 that they brought these before the apostles and praying they laid their hands on them. So we're hearing that the early church is... Uh, practicing this laying on of hands. Maybe in this passage, it's for a d- little bit different reason. It's to consecrate. It's to, to set apart for a specific purpose as we find taking place in the Hebrew Bible. But uh, it's nevertheless going on in the life of the early church as described 
in the book of Acts. This should tell us that the, uh, the teaching of Jesus, Mark 16, and the, and the um, experiences of Jesus, the, the visual aids that he gives, uh, uh, how he lives his life, actually serves t- as a template for the activity of the early church. Acts chapter 8, we get another example of that. They began laying their hands on them, these new uh, people, uh, people that had come to uh, faith in Jesus in Samaria, and they, they were receiving the Holy Spirit. So we're seeing that the impartation of some kind of a, a blessing, some kind of a spiritual empowerment is taking place at the hands of these um, apostles in the early church. Uh, again, in chapter 9, Paul has been um, stricken with blindness, has been blind for three days, and it says of this man who God sent to restore his sight, Ananias entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord who appeared to you by the road has uh, sent me that you might receive your sight and that you be filled with the Holy Spirit. So a kind of a double purpose there, the uh, impartation of, um, uh, of healing as well as um, the, uh, the bringing of a blessing or some kind of spiritual empowerment. In Acts 28, all the way to the end, the last chapter of the book of Acts, we hear about Paul traveling to Rome. He's on these lengthy uh, journeys by sea, by ship, and at one point they're on an island and uh, stopped and he, he uh, lays hands on a person who has fever and dysentery and he lays his hands on him and the man is healed. So what we see in the life and ministry of Jesus, that same kind of emphasis, that same kind of approach to healing is followed in the, uh, in the early church. We also hear about it beyond the book of Acts. In 1 Timothy, Paul tells T- Timothy, a young pastor in Ephesus, don't neglect the spiritual gift within you. It was bestowed on you through, the, through prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. So again, it is a setting someone apart for some special uh, area of service. We'll find this in the Hebrew Bible as well. And um, uh, this is yet another uh, example of that. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, Paul says, Don't lay hands upon anyone too hastily, lest you share in responsibility for whatever sins they commit. Here what's in view is don't get ahead of yourself in recognizing some person for leadership and putting them them in place, setting them apart for a specific purpose of leadership by the laying on of hands. Another example of the same. Now what I'd like to do is Uh, take a look backward into uh, biblical revelation, starting from the beginning with the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and move forward in the Hebrew Bible slash Old Testament just to make sure that we all know where this practice comes from and uh, what's behind it so that we don't end up with a, the conclusion where, uh, somewhat like the miraculous travel when Jesus stepped into the boat in John 6, that this is not a knockoff. It's not a standalone. This is not some bizarre outlier, but this has sort of been there all along and is kind of part and parcel of biblical spirituality and the way that people went about serving God long before the ministry of Jesus, long before the the, the uh, work of the apostles and others in, in the book of Acts, and uh, in uh, we find this as early as the book of Genesis. It part, it's warp and woof. It's part and parcel of how this thing has rolled for centuries and centuries and centuries. So we hear in the life of Abraham, he says to his servant, the oldest, the oldest of his household, he says, please place your hand under my thigh. Uh, the Hebrew is uh, yarech or Uh, The actual phrase here, my thigh is yerechi. And uh, I'm not going to put a picture up there for those of you who uh, know Hebrew of this because it's a little bit of an interesting situation. But the point is contact, is physical touch. And ultimately, the person is required to take an oath uh, by Yahweh, the God of heaven and earth. 
And so um, we have this physical connection, this, this need to, 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 to make contact. This is one reason why COVID is such a mess, is that it has so separated us physically. Human beings have the uh, capacity built within our bodies to be able to feel and to touch, and there's a reason for that. Uh, there are lots of reasons for that, one of them being for mutual support and identification with those who are in need. In the book of Genesis, we have another example of this kind of physical touch and thus identification with another. It says that Israel, that is Jacob, um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, so Jacob stretched out his right hand and laid it on the head of Ephraim, who was the younger of the two children of Joseph, and his left hand he put on Manasseh's head. Here you have a uh, picture illustrating uh, the same. He crossed his hands over so that he could put his right hand, the hand of greatest blessing, on the head of the younger, which is quite interesting. You have here effectively the same laying on of hands that is going on in other places in the Bible, whether Hebrew Bible or all the way into the New Testament with Jesus uh, blessing the children and the like. Uh, in the book of Exodus, uh, here we hear about the sacrificial system. You shall bring the bull before the tent of meeting, that original uh, place of worship uh, in the wilderness. And Aaron and his sons, the high priestly family, will lay their hands on the head of the bull. This is identification and even transference because the sins of the people are confessed onto the sacrificial animal with the laying on of hands. So there is that physical touch. There is that, uh, that, it, there is that transference. There is that full identification. Now that bull is slaughtered in place of a human being that would otherwise have to without the grace and mercy of God, have to die for his or her own sin. In the book of Exodus chapter 29, take one ram, and Aaron and his sons shall lay hands on. It's a different type of animal. Before it was a bull, now, it is a, uh, now it's a ram, and yet the process is the same. Uh, lay the ha hands on the head of the ram, and we get this also in verse 19 of the same chapter. In the book of Levit Leviticus, and this goes back to our last session study together, which had to do with Yom Kippur, the, the Day of Atonement. And uh, this is Leviticus 16. It's the longest treatment of that um, uh, day of commemoration, of remembrance, of, of atonement, the Day of Atonement. Um, and it says there in verse 21 that Aaron shall lay both of his hands on the head of the live goat, and confess over it all the iniquities of the sons of Israel, all their transgressions with respect to all of their sins, and he shall lay them on the head of the goat and send it away. This is full identification uh, of um, a human being now to sacrificial animal by means of the laying on of hands. The, the, the connection cannot be denied at this point. In Numbers chapter 8, uh, you're supposed to present the Levites before the Lord, not the priests that are descendants of Levi, but those who are Levites that do other chores other than the priestly responsibilities. Bring them before the Lord, and the sons of Israel shall lay hands on the Levites. What's the purpose of that? It's not healing. Uh, it's not necessarily blessing as in... Um, to being equipped by us with some spiritual uh, power or ability by God, but this is separating these people apart for an act of special service uh, to the Lord. We saw that in uh, the book of Acts as well as in uh, the writings of Paul in 1 Timothy. The book of Numbers, chapter 27, the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua the son of Nun, a man in whom the, is the Spirit, and lay your hand on him. In verse 23 it says, And then he laid his hands, plural, note that because we're going to come back to that when we're looking at material from the early rabbis. He laid his hands on them and commissioned him just as Yahweh had spoken through Moses. So this is a yet another act of consecration. The Spirit of God is already present in the life of Joshua. 
Um, and so that's not what's in view, but setting him apart for some special act of service, he becomes the successor to Moses as the leader of all the tribes of Israel. Um, this is what's in view in this particular passage. Now, what I would like to do is continue on beyond the Hebrew Bible, and I'd like to look at a couple of passages, a few passages from between the Testaments, from um, the time between Malachi and Matthew to see if there is continuity there, and indeed there is. The first text that I want to look at with you is um, 1Q20. It's called uh, popularly the Genesis Apocryphon. It was uh, material that came out of the first de cave in the Dead Sea Scrolls that was ever discovered. And uh, the uh, text of the Genesis Apocryphon, it's so-called because it sort of, sort of retells the Genesis story, only adding bits and pieces along the way that we don't find in the book of Genesis or Bereshit uh, in, the, in the Hebrew Bible. So we hear about in the uh, life of, uh, of Abraham that uh, af after the Pharaoh had taken his uh, Abraham's wife, Sarah, and made him a part of her, her, his own harem, um, that this story takes place. The, um, uh, the Pharaoh is afflicted with all kinds of uh, physical problems. And so in the Genesis Apocryphon's version, it says that none of the physicians, magicians, or wise men, sages, were able to endure so as to heal him, the Pharaoh who was afflicted by these plagues. And then Harkinosh, the servant of Pharaoh, came to me, beseeching me, the me is Abraham, to go to the king and to pray for him and to lay my hands upon him so that he might live. So I prayed for him and laid my hands on his head and the scourge departed from him and he was healed." Where's this text from? It's from the very early 1st century B.C. or the late 2nd century B.C. This stuff had been around for a couple of hundred years before Jesus begins His earthly ministry sometime around the year 26 or 27 uh, A.D. So, yes, we do have the laying on of hands and specifically for the purpose of bringing physical healing into the life of someone in need. And we have that a couple of hundred years going on before Jesus. And this comes directly out of the Jewish community within the land of Israel. Remember, this is one of the Dead Sea Scrolls. It was found on the northwest shore of the Dead Sea back in 1947 approximately. And these are Jewish writings. They're not Roman Catholic. They're not Protestant. They're not Christian at all. These are pre-Christian Jewish writings that appear in the time of the intertestamental or between the Testaments, between Malachi and Matthew. Very significant uh, uh, piece of, of evidence. Now, did this actually happen? Was this part of the Genesis story? That's not what's important. What we're doing is literary archaeology, digging down into words to discover what people are thinking, believing, and practicing in the Judaisms that were in existence in the second century B.C., prior to Jesus, prior to the early church. Now we're going to move from the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls to another collection of Jewish literature that is outside of the Bible, but uh, authoritative for um, observant Orthodox Jews. The Babylonian Talmud is an example. We hear in Tractate Sanhedrin or Sanhedrin that Moses laid his hands, plural, on Joshua. You remember I asked you to hold on to that passage that we get from uh, the Torah of Moses. He laid his hands on him. God said, lay your hand on him. Moses laid, plural, his hands on him. In also the Babylonian Talmud, in another tractate, Bavakama, it says that Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom for which Moses had laid his hands upon him. There the rabbis are quoting Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 9. Now, why didn't I just, if that's a quote of the Hebrew Bible, why didn't I just quote the book of Deuteronomy? Here's the reason. 
the rabbis in trying to explain why it was that God told Moses to lay his hand on Joshua, but Moses laid his plural two hands on Joshua. The rabbis explained the, the difference, difference as being due to the fact that Moses wanted to make sure that, that Joshua received every bit of the divine enablement of God's Spirit that Moses had walked in for all of those years. So there's an early interpretation of the difference between hand and hands. But you'll notice that again, we've got this emphasis on the divine impartation of some kind of uh, ability that takes us beyond our natural human abilities and also the, the kinds of con sort of consecration or ordination um, setting Joshua apart for this work of special service that God had called him to. Now, we have another passage that I wanted to spend a few minutes discussing with you, and this is from a Midrash. You remember we've talked about Midrash before. This Midrash is kind of like early Bible commentary done by the earliest rabbis, and we have in a, uh, an early Midrash called Bereshit Rabbah, or the Great Genesis. Remember Genesis Apocryphon from the Dead Sea Scrolls? Okay, now we have Bereshit Rabbah. This comes from the early rabbis, and this is going to help us further kind of delve into backgrounds to see if indeed the ministry of Jesus and the modalities or the methods like the laying on of hands that he used and then subsequently his followers used, if those are outliers, if those lie outside the tradition, if those are weird and unusual and um, kind of just baked up, cooked up by the early uh, Christian church. But we hear in this early rabbinic work, Elijah of blessed memory came before Rabbi Judah the prince, disguised as Rabhia the elder, and he laid his hand upon his teeth and cured him. Okay, there we have it, not only in the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, but we also have this healing by the laying on of hands in early rabbinic literature, the material from the early rabbis. When Ra Rabhia subsequently visited Rabbi, he asked him, how is your tooth? Well, since you laid your hand upon it, it is cured, he answered. So we have the laying on of hands, and we have subsequent miracle of healing taking place. Earlier in this story, we had already been told that uh, this toothache had, had beset um, Rabio da Nasi, uh, for 13 years, 13 years. Think of the woman who had the hemorrhage of blood for 12 years and was healed by Jesus. Very interesting and uh, close parallel. I don't know that you can make any more out of it than that, but very interesting. 13 years, 12 years, and then a miraculous healing takes place by the modality of touch. Now, we've looked at the early material from Jesus' life, We've looked at material from the lives of the apostles in the book of Acts and then including Paul and his work. We then worked our way through representative selections of the Hebrew Bible, many more passages that we could have dealt with. I had to be careful in my selection for purposes of, of time and space. But then we continued our discussion, our kind of diachronic survey going beyond the Hebrew Bible. We looked at examples from the pre-Christian Dead Sea Scrolls. We looked at the material from the early rabbinic community, the, uh, from the works of the early rabbis. And what we have found is a, a consistency from Hebrew Bible through the intertestamental period through the New Testament period and all the way toward its end, for sure toward the end of Paul's ministry, we've seen a God who uses these various modalities to meet the needs of the humanity that he created in his own image and in his own likeness, to bring blessing into uh, the lives of people created in his image, to consecrate and to empower people for certain specific purposes created in his own image and after his own likeness. What we've seen from Hebrew Bible to between the Testaments to all the way through the New Testament, we've seen a God who does not exhibit any indication of change. And indeed, when we start looking at the Bible for the nature of God, we find many 
not a couple like I put here on this slide, but many examples where God tells us in various ways, I am Yahweh, I do not change, I don't mutate. Human beings might, the rest of nature might be in a constant state of change, but He is immutable. He does not change. His nature, His basic character traits do not morph. They don't change over time and with various, the passing of various time periods. Now, in the book of Hebrews, just took an example from the Hebrew Bible, now from the New Testament. In the book of Hebrews, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Many of us know these passages by heart. It's one of the reasons why I chose them. But I chose to put these passages up simply to remind us that the God of the Hebrew Bible, the God of the intertestamental period, the God of the New Testament period is the same God today. And this same God who's wanting to expand His kingdom, wanting to demonstrate His kingly rule as well as to bring more people under His rule as the great king. This God who is a God who is merciful and compassionate and a God whose nature doesn't change. This God is the same today as well. And so in a time when we find ourselves getting bad news from either the uh, television or from Facebook or whatever, and we're hearing that people that some that we even know, some people who are very close to us, that they've contracted COVID, that they're struggling there in the hospital. Of all times in my lifetime, this is a time that I've found it important to spend time with God in prayer. And this is not just marking time. It's not just a, quote, good deed. The God of the Bible, you can pick your place. The God of history, Hebrew Bible, between the Testaments, New Testament period, He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. With, all, with everybody, politicians and every business and Wall Street and what have you, everybody's constantly moving the, the goalposts in our lives. It's a really neat thing to know that we have a target that doesn't change. His goalpost doesn't move. He's never baiting and switching. He's not a God who's morphing and changing and He's one way one day, maybe one, one way another day, but this is a God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. This is a God who declares He's Yahweh. And because He's Yahweh, part of His nature is immutability. I do not change. That's the kind of God that we pray to today when we find out that there are people in need that we know about. Some folks, maybe even in our own families, people who are in desperate need of a touch from God. The same God who was having hands laid upon and who was imparting blessing and empowerment and healing in the Hebrew Bible, between the Testaments and in the New Testament, that God is the same today. And you can call out to Him and you, you can expect Him to hear your prayers, be moved to compassion by the situations that you present uh, before Him. And He is a God who has the power to do something about it. He delights to do that. I hope that this has brought a word of encouragement into your life. I hope it also has sort of enlightened you and to, to some degree as to the fact that even though this might be some strange and unusual thing in our 21st century, in the world of the Bible, we saw it from Hebrew Bible to between the Testaments to New Testament. This is simply one of the ways that God has chosen to roll. And I want to encourage you to engage in that uh, yourself. You don't have to be ordained. Uh, you don't have to have, go to some kind of school of ministry. Uh, these signs shall follow them believe uh, them who believe. If uh, as you go uh, in this uh, next week, the coming days and even months of, of your life, if you find uh, that you come across someone who is in need of this, step into that pool of steady, consistent practice. Trust God. It's not about the ritual. It's not even about the holy words that you say over the person in need, but you can trust God to meet you in that, in that moment. God bless you richly today and in the coming days as you go out and serve Him.